Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Holly Duke, the Director of Leadership at the Ron Brown Leaders Network. I just want to thank you all for showing up for our exciting presentation today, um, the interview between uh, Ron Brown Captain Angelica Harris and Naomi Buru, um, also a Ron Brown Captain and a new 2018 Rhodes Scholar. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to turn it to these ladies to show you the agenda for the day. And we're going to go through a few questions that were submitted in advance, but we're going to also take questions at the end. So if you want to ask a question um, to uh, Naomi or Angelica, what you're going to do is you can either type it into the chat box. If you look at your screen, you see a control panel that has a chat box or there's a little hand icon. If you hit the hand icon, we'll take you off mute and you can ask your question out loud. Um, so that's it for the housekeeping and take it away, ladies. Well, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great Thursday. Thank you for joining us for the Q&A session with Naomi Baru. Uh, my name is Angelica Harris. I attend Washington University in St. Louis. I'm a sophomore, double majoring in finance and computer science. And I'm so happy today to be interviewing Naomi Baru, who's a senior studying com computer, I mean, chemical engineering at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And she's the first person from her school to receive the Rhodes Scholar. So congratulations, Naomi. Thank you, Angelica. Yeah, the Rhodes Scholarship was established in 1902 and it's international postgraduate award for students. Oops, my thing, I can't see the whole screen. Okay. Um, to study at the University of Oxford. Uh, Oxford. Um, there are four standards by which applicants are judged. So literary, literary and scholastic attainment, energy to use one's talent to the fullest, truth and courage and devotion, Um, de I mean, devotion to duty, sympathy for, and protection of the weak, and kindliness, unselfishness, and fellowship. And finally, moral force of character and instinct to lead and to take an interest in one's fellow being. So first, we're going to start off with Naomi um, introducing herself um, and giving her, giving us a little bit about her research interests and any extracurricular activities. So Naomi. Okay, so thank you guys for joining me on this webcast and thank you Angelica for inviting me and, and uh, Mrs. Duke for inviting me to come talk to you guys for a little bit. So a little bit about myself. I attend the University of Maryland, Baltimore County and here at UMBC, I'm really involved in the National Society of Black Engineers. So I served as our uh, pre-college initiative chair my sophomore year and then I was chapter president and now I serve on the Nesby Regional Board um, apart from like Nesby and engineering things, um, I also really like to run. So I run a lot with my friends. Um, I completed a Tough Mudder last year. That was really exciting. And I'm trying to train for a half marathon with my friends. Um, some other things I'd like to do. I'm into gymnastics. So I've been learning how to tumble because I like to tumble. Um, and I'm on the cheer team. And I also do gospel choir. In terms of my research interests, in uh, right now, I'm really interested in like energy research. So I work in an energy lab at my school. Um, it's in the computer engineering department and we focus on making biofuel cells. And in the past, I've done research in a lot of different areas. I really look for opportunities that have like interdisciplinary back like natures. So where I can use my chemical engineering background to solve a issue in biology or an issue in computer engineering or an issue in mechanical engineering. So in the past, um, I've done research uh, at Vanderbilt University working on developing a 3D printed artery model. And then after that, I did research at the European Organization for Nuclear Research uh, in Switzerland. And I was working on developing a system where we could monitor their gas systems for one of their really big detectors on their Hadron Collider. And then the next summer, I was working at Intel uh, working really in more of like a finance businessy role, understanding how supply chain works and how we can use the knowledge of engineers to kind of like beat the system and pay less for equipment essentially. So I've done a lot of different kinds of research, but um, it all kind of falls under the umbrella of like interdisciplinary problem solving. Wow. 
You've done a ton. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, next question. Um, when did you decide to apply to Rhodes and how soon did you, uh, did you prepare? I first thought about applying my freshman year. One of my professors from the Honors College he came up to me and said, I think you'd be a good candidate for Rhodes. And so I looked online at the website and all of the bios were ridiculous. Like the people had been doing just things from birth, like everyone was out of this world, like incredible. And I kind of put that thought on the back burner. I was thinking like, that's that's a lot. Like, I don't, I don't know if <laughs> I'm quite at that level. Um, but I'll think about it. Thank you for saying that maybe I could do that. So I didn't really think much about it for the next like two years. And then junior year, I sat down again with that professor. He was then in charge of um, the roads process for my school. So I sat down with him and I said, yeah, you know, I think I might actually want to do this thing. Um, what would I even have to do to start? How should I start preparing? Uh, what's the timeline? So he sat down in fall semester of my junior year. And then we really didn't start the application process or anything until maybe the summertime. It's a little bit later at my school just because there were some logistical things that had to change. So um, it started pretty late at my school, but in the summertime was when I spent a lot of time writing essays and like thinking about what I wanted to do at Oxford. And um, in September, I submitted my materials and then from there, like that's when the process really started kicking in where he started doing practice interviews and um, then the actual interview and then you hear back like the same day. So that's all pretty quick after you submit your application, but everything else, it really depends on, I guess, your school and how defined their process is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, so um, how did mentoring play a role in your process? Who were your mentor? or mentor or ment uh, mentors, how did you become connected with them? My main mentor is my research supervisor here at UMBC. She works mm -hmm. in the, she's in charge of the lab that I work in, in the computer engineering department. And I really look up to her as a person, like she's very, very strict, which makes working in lab um, a challenge, but like a good challenge because I grow a lot as a person. And I talked, I reach out to her a lot when I'm asking for like letters of recommendation or even thinking about what I want to do next or what I should do for the summers. So she's really helped like guide me through the way and start to like synthesize how I can use my interest and the things I'm good at to actually do something important and like something that I want to do. So that's been really useful. And then for the whole Rose process, the um, prestigious scholarships advisor at my school she was incredibly helpful the whole time, helping me with understanding like what the deadlines were, how I had to submit things, because it's not like a simple, you sit, click the submit button, like someone else has to submit it for you. It's like a whole thing. So she helped me understand like what exactly I needed to do, um, figuring out how we can do practice interviews, and then also helping me to like think introspectively and understand like why am I even applying for this scholarship and what exactly how will it benefit me and how what should I do there that will be most beneficial because you can do a good degree in anything you can do a bachelor's a master's a doctorate you can switch disciplines I could do humanity science so we spent a lot of time just talking it out and thinking like well I could do this but like I don't really know what I'd do with that or like I could do this but maybe the school isn't best for that but the school is really good for that um, so it's really good to have people to like bounce ideas off of um, yeah. and those are my main two people. Did you have any mentors outside of school? Just wondering. Outside of school? Yeah. No, nah, nah, I don't think so. Not through this process. Okay. Most of them were through my school. Okay. Yeah. Um, ne next question. Towards the end, how much time per week did you dedicate to the roads process? So I know this was like a really long, long, well, long process, and then you said that you heard back that one day. So just wondering. Yeah. So towards the end, it became definitely a lot more work, especially closer to the essay deadlines. Um, so I remember I would spend like just as much time as I possibly could every day tweaking the essays, also thinking about like how I could like craft my resume to look or try to, you know, portray a, a 
a different idea about myself or something like that. The, the one big thing about the roads is that your application materials aren't a lot. You only have an essay and it's a thousand words max and a resume and that's it. Like there's no other questions. There's like nothing else. Um, so, and then you have letters of rec, but you don't know what's in those letters of recommendation. So you really have to work on figuring out what to put in your resume, how to put it in your resume, um, and then what to put in your essay that isn't like backpacking or like um, piggybacking off of what you put in your resume. Because if it's just a rigor regurgitation of your resume, then they're just gonna think that that's all you are and then move on. Um, so it's really, it was really, really difficult, like understand, trying to piece together like what I wanted to put where and like what was the most strategic way to do that. So towards the end, I would say I was spending probably like at least an hour a day, but sometimes it was three, four hours, five hours in one day, just like going through my essays, reading my essays to other people, like out loud. So I, there weren't, oh, I, you can't read the essay, but like reading the essay out loud to myself and then like going through like kind of the ideas of um, what I wanted to do. And uh, during that process, I was also applying for another scholarship called the Marshall. And that one's pretty similar to the Rhodes. So there were a lot of essays that were due the same time. And those ones can be read by other people. So I was like going through those two. So it's just like a lot of essay writing um, all at once. And it spent, took a lot of time over the last, the last like two months of the process. Yeah, I bet that sounds like a lot of essays. Okay, now our next question. What were you most and least favorite parts of the application process? I'm pretty sure it's the essays, but if there's anything else, <laughs> the essays is probably your least favorite or it could be your favorite. So my most favorite part of the process was by far the uh, interview weekend when we got to, when I got to meet all the other people who are applying from my region. And the actual interview I thought was kind of fun, but even like before that, you spend like the whole weekend with these like really amazing people. And then you don't really like, I guess, when you meet them, you realize how amazing they are. But then after the fact, like people are still doing just amazing things. And like, it's just crazy. Like when I came back from the interview weekend, someone that I friended um, from the weekend, I found out that he was one of like the Forbes 30 under 30. And I was like, what? Like, this is crazy. Like I was just hanging out with you, like eating burgers and like chilling. And you're just like doing all of these amazing, crazy things. So interacting with, um, the people from my region who were also applying during the interview weekend was like by far the the best part of the whole process and the least favorite part for me honestly it was trying to figure out what exactly i wanted to do at oxford um just because there are just so many different things you can do and I, it doesn't necessarily pay, play a huge bearing on like your the success of your application or anything but um, just thinking about like, is this a school that I actually want to go to or like, can I, will I actually like benefit from this or which degree out of the, you know, tens of hundreds of degrees that you can do at Oxford, like which one should I do? Right. To me, that was just like really stressful and it was really hard for me to like figure that out. And I felt like I couldn't write my essays until like I knew what I wanted to do there. So that was like a big like stumbling block. But at one point I realized I just have to pick something and then if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But like, you won't know all of the answers until you just pick something and go with it. Well, that leads into our next question. What will you do at Oxford? So at Oxford, I'm, I'm, a, I'm intending to do a doctorate in engineering science and I'm gonna be focusing on nuclear fusion reactor technology type stuff. So I reached out to a professor in September who works at Oxford and he's doing research on like heat transfer for like next generation fusion, fusion, uh, nuclear fusion reactors. So I reached out to him in September. He responded like almost instantly and we Skyped. And I also was able to talk to two of his grad students. So um, I got a good idea like what the lab was gonna be like and like what kind of research I would be doing if I got in and then I got in. So, um, I'm gonna be working in his lab, doing my doctorate for three to four years, most likely four, um, but usually the degree is three to four years. So that's what I'll be doing. <laughs> wow, that's really nice. Um, what is your advice for people who want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, so I guess the biggest, 
I guess there's two things, one for the process and one for like before the process. So before the process, I think it's really important to like not let your wanting to apply for the roads like kind of shape what you do in college. Um, yeah, it might be kind of counterintuitive, but I know there's like a lot of schools where if you're, if someone tells you like someone taps on the shoulder and says, you're going to be the next road scholar, they say, you need to do this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it's just like not necessary. Um, and honestly, you end up kind of probably unhappy because you're not doing the things that you want to do. And like, regardless of if you win the scholarship or don't win the scholarship, you're all going to be doing like amazing things. And you shouldn't let like, you shouldn't define like what you do in college to kind of like shape yourself for this one scholarship. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give an example of that. So um, when I was applying or when I was thinking about applying, everyone was saying like, you have to be involved in a sport. Like you have to be like a sport captain or like a, someone like an all-american like some person who's really really big in sports or something about sports because um like angelica was saying one of the guidelines is that you use your talents to the full and most people exhibit that by being an athlete like if you look at the profiles the majority of them are athletes so in my head i was thinking like okay like maybe i should try the sports thing but like honestly that's just like not me um, i like running recreationally with my friends but joining a team and like putting in all that effort for sports wasn't something that I wanted to do. So like I didn't do it and I still won. But um, I did spend a lot of time like doing the things that I think are important for myself and like things that I cared about, like joining the National Society of Black Engineers or like doing gospel choir or just like doing things that made me happy and that I would be proud of regardless of if I won or not. So that's like one big piece of advice. And another one for the actual process if you do make it to the, um, make it as one of your schools, um, one of the people that your school, your school puts forth, and then also if you make it to the interview, which is make sure you just do everything and get everywhere early. Um, so I, I had a lot of, there's a lot of things I wish I had done earlier, like finishing the essay earlier, um, sending my transcripts earlier, because they have to be physically mailed. Um, and a lot of it was just like, I just didn't know, like for my school, a lot of things were like kind of up in the air since you never had a road scholar, the process isn't defined, but doing things early, like saves you a lot of stress. There was one point when I was actually going to drive to the British embassy to mail my <laughs> transcript because we didn't know we had to mail one and it was due like that day and the mail wouldn't get it there in a day. So I was actually gonna have to drive and like, it was a whole mess, but it could have been like easily mitigated if like we had planned to do things early. Um, and then also well, like when you get to the interview, I was actually the first person at the cocktail dinner that they have before the actual interview. So like on Friday night, there's a cocktail dinner and then Saturday mornings your interviews. And like being the first person was actually really great because I met all the judges like all at once. And one of the things that people tell you to do is you have to talk to all the judges. Um, Cause if you don't talk to one of them, then like they have no opinion of you or anything to go off of on the next day when they actually interview you. So I just met them all at once. Like it was less stress during the um, actual cocktail dinner for me to like meet them because I already knew who they were. Um, I was able to have like those conversations early and then I could spend the rest of the time like getting to know the other people who had been selected. And then also like getting to talk to some of the, um, some of like the staff and people like that. So yeah, getting places early and doing things early is really important. Yeah. Um Going back to um, when you talked about like your four year doc, after you finish your four year doctor, um, PhD degree. Um, so what do you plan on doing after that? Are you going to do research or are you going to, like, do you know where you want to work? That's all really up in the air right now. I have actually just no idea what I want to do. Part of me wants to be a professor because I really like interacting with students. Um, but I don't know if, I feel like there's something else probably that I'm going to end up doing. I don't, I'm not so sold on the whole professor thing right now. So um, right now it's really up in the air. <laughs> yeah, you have a lot of time. Oh, well, yeah. Um, so now we're going to open it up for the audience members to ask any questions. Um, so hey, if you guys have Holly. questions, you can post mm -hmm. it in the chat pod. Um, we have a question. It's from um, I, I, Aya, and you can tell me if I mispronounce your name. Okay, I'm going to take you off mute now, Aya, Aya Evans, so you can ask your question. Go ahead. 
Ayaya, can you hear me? All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Oh, okay. Hi, it's Aya. Um, okay. And my question is, my question is, if you go to a school, if you're going to go to a school that's not, like, elite, I guess, like an Ivy or a top 20, is it harder to become a Rhodes Scholar? Or is it, like, were there challenges that you faced because um, you didn't, I guess, go to an Ivy League or something? Because I'm not going to one, and I'm still interested in it. Yeah, that's actually a really great question. So being completely honest, it is definitely harder in some ways. Um, and I'll kind of explain that. So when you go to say like Harvard or Yale, in some aspects, it's a little harder to win it just because a lot of people are interested in like the scholarship. So you have competition internally at your school. Um, but then since they have so many people who are interested, they have like entire scholarship offices that are just focused on preparing students for the roads or preparing students for the marshal. So their processes are a lot more defined. Um, even I have a friend who goes to NC State and he applied for um, a similar scholarship and they have, everything's due in August, like before the application is even like, that's like a month before the application is due, everything was due. Um, and then they had interviews beforehand and all of this stuff just because their school has had scholars before. Um, at my school, since we've never had one before, we have one person who's like in charge of submitting the application, but she also has like other jobs like apart from this. So, and she was also new. So her and I were just learning everything all at once. Um, that's why a lot of things were kind of done last minute because we both just didn't know like how things were supposed to be submitted or like what to go through. Um, and it honestly did make it a lot more challenging just because um, I didn't get to do like even a practice interview until after I'd found out that I'd gotten to the final round. And between, there's like a two, two week time period between like when you find out and when the actual interview is. So there's not a lot of time to prepare, um, but like my school just didn't have like the like resources to like just be doing these interviews all the time. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. And then also like, there was no one in my school for me to talk to, to ask like how the process went or anything because just like no one had done it. So that was just like really difficult. But there were a couple of pros of doing it at a smaller school. So one, since I was the only person who was interested in <laughs> like doing the whole road thing at my school. So um, the scholarship advisor didn't have like a ton of people that she was focusing on. So um, that was a pro and then Another positive thing about kind of going to a, a bit of a lesser known school is sometimes, um, apart from like there not being a lot of competition within your school to get past like the immediate like first round, I found that my school as a whole was like more supportive of this process just because they really wanted like, they really wanted this for the school because they had never had one. And like, if I was at like Harvard or Princeton or something like, I probably wouldn't have received as much support from my teachers and professors and even like my research mentors just because like it wouldn't have been such so big of a deal. <laughs> but after like I got past the first round, like people were very willing to like help me and like um, get me the practice interviews that I needed. And then like when I won, the whole school felt like they'd won. So that was like really exciting and that probably wouldn't happen um, at other schools. Um, and you kind of get to really like shape your own experience, which could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. but. Um, since no one was really telling me like what I needed to do all four years, like no one selected me freshman year and said you're going to be the next Rose Scholar, like it was kind of up to me the whole time. It made it a lot more personable and more real for me. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, any other questions? And I have a question, I think, while we wait for other questions. This is Holly. With tell us more about those cocktail parties because that would make that part would make me nervous. Did how many were there and were they did etiquette matter and did you have to pay attention to that kind of stuff? Yeah, so the cocktail dinner is actually the first thing, the first part of the interview weekend. So the interview weekend starts on Friday around like 5 p.m. and then everything ends on Saturday at whatever time they decide to end. So on Friday, um, like I said, the cocktail dinner started at five. So um, it's not really like an eating thing. Like there are appetizers, but you're not like sitting down and eating. So etiquette isn't a huge thing. The only thing that I really needed to consider was like how to juggle like eating and then like having a drink in your hand and then also like talking to someone. 
Um, Cause then sometimes like it can kind of be like a lot if you only have two hands and like no table or anything. Um, but um, also like there's, there is like wine available and like alcohol, but we were all advised not to drink that. So that's also like something that you should keep in mind. Um, there are, there is food and there is like drinks, but it's probably not the time to like eat or drink because you have like other things that you're trying to do at the time. Um, it's not long. It's only about an hour and a half. And halfway through, they stop everyone. We stand in a circle and you introduce yourself, say what school you're from, what you're planning to do at Oxford, I think. And then like a fun fact. So I remember my fun fact was that I ran a 5K in a gorilla suit on my campus like the week before because it was, I think it was Thanksgiving or Halloween. I don't know. It was a holiday before. So we ran like a um, a race at my school and I was running it in a gorilla suit. So that was like my fun fact. People go around like they give their fun facts. It has to be something that's not on your application and not on your resume. So people are giving like interesting things. Um, but yeah, during the cocktail hour, you have to make sure that you talk to all of the judges. And then also it's important to talk to the other students. So there's usually 12 to 14 students at my weekend, there were 13 because one student uh, dropped out. So there were 13. And um, it's important to talk to the students because the judges have in the past, like asked different scholars, like during their interview, if we don't select you, which other scholar do you think we should like select from the weekend? And if you haven't talked to anyone and you don't know anyone's name, then you don't have an answer to that question. So um, someone from my school actually got that question last year. Um, I didn't get that question, but um, if I had gotten it, I would have had, like, I had a list of people in my head of, like, who they were, some cool things that they'd done, and, like, stuff like that, which is also why it's really good to get there early, so you can make sure you talk to everybody, um, get people's names, stuff like that. Awesome. All right, here's another question um, from the audience. How did you get such great internships? <laughs> A big part of it is really attributed to a scholarship program that I'm in at my school. So I'm part of the scholarship program called Meyerhoff. And my freshman year, they make you apply to at least 17 internships. And um, 17 is a lot. <laughs> like, there's a lot of essays. Sometimes they have more than one essay for the um, application. Sometimes it's like three essays. It's a lot of letters of recommendation, a lot. Um, but the reason that they do that is because a lot of times like freshmen don't get internships because like in the grand scheme of things they're the least like the least i guess viable candidates since they don't have experience so if you apply to 17 like the odds are at least one of them will be like oh, okay like this person like we need a freshman or like this this person like is uh, would be a good fit for our program but if you apply to like five then it's a very high chance that you're going to be rejected from like all five so um, freshman year, that's that, that's what got me like um, the internships that I was getting. And then after that, um, another big thing that I did was reaching out to the program supervisor. So I wanted to work at CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, but I wasn't a physics major. Um, I actually wasn't that good at physics, um, but I really wanted to work there. I was a chemical engineer and I applied for a program or I wanted to apply for a program. And they said they only wanted uh, physics majors, computer engineers, and mechanical engineers. So I emailed the program coordinator and I said, hi, like I'm really interested in the program, but I'm a chemical engineer, but I've done like these classes and they're similar to what the mechanical engineers would take. And I really think I'd be a great fit for this program because like there's some parts of chemistry that would, I like, I said all these things. And the program supervisor emailed me back and said, yeah, go ahead and apply. And then I got it. And like, I don't think I would have gotten it if I hadn't reached out to this program supervisor and like expressed my interest and expressed the fact that I had looked at the application. I saw that like I wasn't quite eligible, but I was passionate about it and I wanted to do it. And I submitted everything really early. So I heard back like really, really quickly and I got it. So um, that helped out like a ton. And then for my last internship, going to conferences helps a lot. So since I'm really big in Nesby, um, I have a lot of connections with people in different companies because the career fair at Nesby, um, their career fairs are huge. So you can just meet all kinds of people from all kinds of companies. So keeping in contact with them helps a lot when you like need a summer internship or I even hook my friends up with summer internships just because I know so many people from different companies, just like networking at conferences. Awesome. Okay, so this question is from Uche and this might have some like 
millennial slang in it that an old lady like me doesn't. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to read it. It seems that the Rhodes Scholarship looks for scholars who are well-rounded with a bump. How did you manage to convey that through your resume and essay? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, with Rhodes, you definitely have to make sure that there is some kind of, like, bump, like she was saying, about, like, something that about you that makes you different from just, like, every other chemical engineer, every other, whatever your major is in your department, and for me, like, I was really nervous that I didn't have that bump, since, like, I wasn't an athlete, that's usually what the bump is, that, like, oh, I'm, like, an all-American cross-country runner and I won all these awards and like that's your bump because you're also like a straight 4.0 finance major um for me that's really when like the essay came in so my essay didn't like if you were to take the pieces that were everything was in my resume I didn't repeat like anything in my essay like there there was very like little overlap so in the essay I was really just explaining like why I care about the things that I care about and like why I spend time like going to these conferences, spending time like getting groups of people to get into engineering and all of that because that's something that I care a lot about and like that was that's like my bump like my um the thing that I spend a lot of time in apart from like my engineering studies and apart from like the things I do for school and that really like shined through in my um essay and then also like in my responses to the questions that they asked me during the interview it all really boils down to like what you're passionate about and like how you spend your time cultivating that. Um, Cause uh, one thing that kind of like threw me off guard about the questions that they ask you during the interview is that they don't ask you like what you're gonna do at Oxford. Like they don't really care <laughs> what you're gonna do at Oxford. They wanna know how you're gonna change the world. And that has to be portrayed through most likely your essay, but also like through your resume and like through your letters of recommendation and through how you carry yourself. So you have to have some kind of like narrative of like, this is why I'm in this club. This is why I'm doing this outside of school. And this is why I spent all this time doing that. And if it's not like cohesive and you're not able to explain that and you're not able to tie it into how you intend to one day change the world in whatever way you intend to change the world, then they like see through it really quickly and like they, they won't um, accept that. So that's like, yeah, that would be my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, two more questions. As an applicant who is a female of color, did you ever feel like you were at a disadvantage? And if so, how did you work to resolve it? Okay. Um, in terms of the Rose process, there definitely were times where I felt like I was singled out for being an African American or also being a female. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple of situations. So the committee, as you can probably guess, they're all like older white males, like primarily. And like when I first arrived, like I said, I arrived early. And the first question that I got, like when I got to the cocktail hour was like, where are you from? And I say like Baltimore, <laughs> like, no, like, where are you actually from? And I, I didn't understand like why that had to be the first question out of like everything you could possibly ask me, like, you have my whole resume, you have my whole, um, like my essays and everything, like why, why is that important? Um, and then after my interview, at the very end, like after we were saying like, I gave my question, yet you have a chance to ask a question at the end, I asked my question. So after they'd answered my question, um, one of them like made a comment about, I had hair at the time, so I had braids, like long braids. And one of them made a comment about like my braids and asked like, um so like oh like your braids they look really really not like nice like I wonder how long they took for you to do and like it was just like really inappropriate in my opinion like it had nothing to do with my application nothing to do with like anything it was just like them kind of I guess wondering about me being different from them and it just didn't seem like the appropriate setting but uh during times like that it, I felt like it was the best move was just to like not to seem like flustered and not to seem annoyed or um any kind of way even if you did just because like in the real world like things we things like this is going to happen um some people aren't as exposed to diversity as others and if you're going to be like 
traveling across the seas to like a different continent where um, people primarily aren't going to look like you. you're going to have to get used to that kind of thing and not like accept it, but just be able to like conduct yourself in a way where like you're not affected by it and you can just kind of like keep going because um, it, it might happen and uh, most likely will happen. So you just have to like be prepared to keep going. Um, it's happened like before the interview. It's happened definitely at my school being a female in like engineering and also being like an African-American in engineering. Um, there are definitely people who like make comments about me being in certain classes or um, people are nosy for no reason and want to know it's like a lot of things but it ultimately comes down to like you have to be just like confident in yourself and um, sometimes you have to know like when to share information and when not to because um, people sometimes don't have your best interest at hand when they're asking you like what grade did you get on that exam or like what how did you do on this test? They might be asking you because they want to make sure that they're better than you because they think that girls suck. So like keeping that information to yourself, that, that's what I do. I live by that. So, um, and really being confident in yourself. Thank you. How did you balance research with and extracurriculars with school? Okay. Yeah, that was definitely, it's definitely difficult, but it's really a matter of like thinking about what your priorities are and setting those and then kind of scheduling everything after that. So for me, I really care about sleeping. Like I, I love to sleep and I need my eight hours every night, like every night. So um, I knew that if I needed to, like to sleep this much and I needed to like also do all these other activities that I have to do things like ahead of time. So whenever I get an assignment at school, I start the assignment the day I get it, like the millisecond that I see it posted, I start the assignment so that I can try to finish as much as possible as quickly as possible so that if I have questions, I'm not waiting, you know, at midnight on the last day, I can't ask anyone for help because it's midnight, all of these things. If you do it early, then you can quickly just go to office hours, ask your question, finish the homework assignment, and then you're done. Like you're clear of mind when something pops up last minute, which happens like a ton especially with my role in Nesby and with like research, sometimes like you just have to be in lab for longer than you expected, or you have to spend more time like trying to put out a fire in like something that's happening in your organization or more time practicing for a big performance. You have the time to do that because you're not like, you've done all the assignments that are due the next day. You're just focusing on getting yourself ahead for the next week. So if you have to fall back on that for a little while, like it's okay, you're not, like it's not setting you back. Um, and I also have a lot of really good friends who help me in my department um, stay on top of things. So we all are like helping each other all the time, making sure that we're doing assignments like as quickly as possible or as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, that those were like my main big things. Excellent. Well, that's it for questions from my end. Angelica, do you have anything else that you think we should cover? before we let her go? Yeah, I have one quick thing. So you said um, earlier that your most difficult part was selecting the field you wanted to study in. Um, so like once you get there, are you able are you able to switch fields or like is that not allowed or it's just way harder to switch? You're allowed to switch fields after, but they strongly advised against switching fields. I guess because it's sort of it's a setback and like if you're switching major fields then you could end up staying a whole another year and that becomes like an issue of one funding honestly like <laughs> that's a lot like they'd have to fund you for the one year that you um change your major and then also the next year and um also like it's not guaranteed sometimes that you'll get into like the other um field if you're applying again um just because something to keep in mind is a lot of the programs at oxford are really 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 competitive um, more so in the humanities realm than the science or STEM field, but um, they even tell us if you're applying for a humanities degree, some of the degrees have just incredibly low acceptance rates just because they only allow like a handful of people every year and they get just hundreds and hundreds of applications. So um, they have some students like who are Rhodes Scholars like apply for multiple programs just because like your odds of getting in even though you've won the scholarship are still very small just because of the nature of the program and just how small the class sizes are um 
So that's like also something to keep in mind that if you're doing humanities that like your top choice might not be like exactly feasible um, just because of how competitive it is. But if you're doing STEM, then you're usually fine. So it really just depends. Oh. Well, um, are, those, are there any more questions? There, there's um, one more, Naomi. This is a quick one. Um, somebody is asking, do you think it's important to have all A's? 4.0? No, I mean, I don't have a 4.0, so it doesn't really, you should definitely have a, a high GPA because I, there's no minimum, I don't think, but for the most part, people had like above a 3.9, but like having a one or two Bs definitely uh, shouldn't stop you. Good advice. Um. Any more questions <laughs> from the audience? Okay, well, I guess that's it. Um, thank you so much, Naomi. I know like you're probably really busy right now trying to finish up senior year and classes, but we really thank you for your time. Um, all your information was helpful. Um, and this session's recorded for anyone um, who didn't make this, um, this event. So thank you again. And no everyone has a Great rest of their week. Bye, guys. Thanks for Bye. tuning in. Thank you. Bye.